When you think of the Nintendo Switch, what exactly comes to mind? Maybe you immediately think of its portability and unique take on bridging the gap between handheld and home consoles. Or maybe you look at its catalog of games such as Mario, Zelda, Hentai Star's Definitive Edition. I mainly use my Nintendo Switch to play games the likes of Mario Kart, Tears of the Kingdom and, I don't know, Suica game. But I would bet that there's a high chance that the majority of you didn't know that you could play Resident Evil titles directly on your Nintendo Switch. I mean, think about it, it makes sense. One of my earliest experiences with the franchise was playing Resident Evil 4 on my friend's Nintendo Wii. The Switch may not hold up to the standards of current gen home consoles, but it definitely compares well against, say, the PS3 or Xbox 360 for example. So it's no surprise that searching for Resident Evil titles on the Nintendo Switch store actually returns results. Right now, you can buy 7 Resident Evil titles and download them directly to your Switch, with some of the newer titles even being available via Cloudplay. One of these titles is my all-time favourite, Resident Evil 5, and this is one of the 7 that doesn't require an internet connection to play. I can play it whenever I want, and wherever I want. When I initially found this out, it was during my filming of the Lost in Nightmares speedrun video, so I bought it because I thought it would be an interesting talking point. I didn't end up including any mentions of the Switch version of this game, but I did notice something when I was looking into it. I noticed that you can play Resident Evil 5 using the motion controls built into the Switch's Joy-Cons, and my god is it awful. For most people, their experience using motion controls on the Switch is probably in Mario Kart, where you can tilt your Joy-Cons to control your vehicle. It works pretty well in that, but in this, it's very different. To start, you can only use the motion controls when aiming your weapon, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, I can't even begin to imagine how it would be implemented into movement or any of the other mechanics. And when you do use motion control, it's very hard. If you think back to the Nintendo Wii, you would always know where you were pointing because it was designed to feel that way thanks to the sensor bar that you would place by your TV. With this though, you can move your Joy-Con in literally any direction and it would just keep going because there are no limits to what you can point at like with the Nintendo Wii. There is no sensor bar, it's all built into the Joy-Con. In most cases, that's a pretty good feature. More free movement is usually a good thing. For this game though, it can get very frustrating very quickly. If you aim to the right, for example, then you're moving your jog onto the right and that's pretty neat. But if you let go of your aim, then that new position is your new center and you have to keep readjusting your arm before you can aim again. Otherwise, you're just going to spin in your chair and eventually you're not going to be looking at your screen anymore. The point I'm trying to make is that using motion controls to aim is kind of tough and I was left imagining how awful it would be to play the entire game using only motion controls. And then I thought about how ridiculous it would be to actually try that. And then I- Resident Evil 5 So I just thought, fuck it. If I really, really hate playing this game with motion controls, then I'll just give up and I won't make a video on it and I'll carry on with my life and nothing will change. So with that in mind, I booted up the game and dove straight into the settings. I made sure to turn on motion controls and I also fiddled with the sensitivity a little. I hadn't tried it out yet to see how sensitive the aim actually was, but I figured I want to sit still during my playthrough and I definitely didn't want to end up spinning in circles. Once I turned on motion controls, I started a new game and chose the veteran difficulty because I really wanted to test exactly how hard this would be. As soon as we load into the first chapter, you don't get to experiment with the motion controls because you don't have a weapon. You do, however, get to take a look at all of the different NPCs in this area and just look at how horrifying some of the models are. I mean, this guy's eyes are literally about to pop out of his head. Also, I bet you didn't know that this guy over here actually has audio for his drinking animation. I'm not sure why the developers felt this was necessary since the majority of us would probably be more interested in looking at this beating going on over here, but I thought it was pretty cool. Anyways, once I finally got a hold of a weapon, it dawned on me just how sensitive the aim really is. I mean, this is me trying my best to aim straight, and it's just flying all over the place. So yeah, I had to turn down the sensitivity again, but at least now I knew how sensitive it actually was. Moving on, I made my way towards our very first enemy encounter in this building. I was worried I'd instantly regret choosing veteran or even starting this playthrough, but it turns out you don't even need to move your aim here. You can just aim and shoot at the same time without adjusting and he goes down. 
Um, I was hoping I could use this guy to get a feel for the motion controls a bit more, but Sheva cleaned him up instead. One of the limitations of using a controller over mouse and keyboard is that your camera movement can be very slow. And although you can't use motion controls to move your camera in this game, I did think about if it would be possible to use your gun's aim with the motion controls as a sort of workaround to this. I tried it here and it kind of worked. I think you could probably implement this into other areas of the game, but it would definitely take some getting used to since you have to move your arm quickly in the real world, which can be a bit uncomfortable. I also soon realized that the motion controls work with the knife too, which makes sense since readying your knife lets you choose where you want to attack, but it did catch me by surprise. It's a little tricky to get the hang of, but I figured out that if you hold your Joy-Con in the air before readying your knife, you can then ready your knife and put your arm back into a slightly more relaxed position and you'll be looking down at any barrels you want to break. Once we made it to the execution site, I was ready for my first real challenge. Or so I thought. I tucked myself into this corner and realized very quickly that maybe veteran difficulty wasn't the right choice. Not only were there a ton of enemies, but I crumbled under the pressure of trying to use motion controls to fight them off and I wasted a lot of ammo. Eventually, the enemies were cleared and the executioner opened the gate for us and that's when I set my first goal in this section, which was to kill the executioner and take its treasure. I thought this would be simple enough since I've done it before, even on this difficulty, but I just really was not prepared to miss every single shot possible. I missed and I got hit and I repositioned and I panicked and yeah, I died. I actually died. But probably the first time since I was a kid, I died in chapter 1-1 and it was completely unintentional. I gave it another go, a little more prepared with the ammo from the last attempt, and I managed to control the crowd here a little bit better. The executioner opened the gate, and I really did give it a good go, but my motion controls failed me. I missed an important shot on the red barrel, and when it came to fending off this guy with only a slither of health, I missed again. It asked me if I wanted to try again, and I had to choose no. It was late at the time of recording, and I really wanted to decrease the difficulty since I was already struggling to hit my shots. So, I took a break for the night and got back to it the next day playing on amateur difficulty. Once I made it back to the execution site, I realized just how tough veteran would have been because I breezed through this section with ease. I killed the executioner, collected some resources including grenades, ammo and an SMG, and finally we beat chapter 1-1. I was feeling pretty good about this with the new difficulty, so I carried on. Since we're sat here working at the end of chapter screen, I wanted to mention that my main goal for this playthrough was to look at the stats shown at the end of each chapter and by the end of the game, I would have a final number for my accuracy, number of kills, number of deaths, and how long it took for me to beat the whole game. With this, I would be able to put numbers behind my experience using motion controls so that it wouldn't just be my opinion that forms a conclusion on whether or not it was worth my time to even play like this. In chapter 1-2, I tried to take as many fights as I could so that I could get used to the motion controls a little bit more. I launched Sheva up here to retrieve the old building key because I knew this would trigger a few enemy spawns, and after fighting these guys, I felt like I had way more control over my aim compared to if I used the controller. It definitely didn't compare to using a mouse though. When I got to the old building, I decided to pick up the shotgun so that I could test different weapons using motion controls. The shotgun definitely felt easier to use, but I think that's just because it has such a wide bullet spread and it gives you a little bit of time between shots to adjust your aim too. The margin for error is pretty small. After progressing a bit further, we came across one of the many BSAA emblems that you can break in the game. Usually they're a bit far away or in a tricky spot to shoot, so I decided to use these as an example of how annoying the motion controls can be to aim with. If you watch me try to shoot this one in particular, you'll see that my aim slightly sways off of the emblem as soon as I'm about to shoot. And that's because as I squeeze the back trigger on the Joy-Con to shoot, my wrist slightly moves and that fucks with my aim a little bit meaning I have to aim a little bit higher than where I want to shoot in order to compensate for this. Taking the elevator down, I was mentally preparing to fight the first boss in the game, the goth spaghetti, and then I remembered that I didn't need to mentally prepare for this fight whatsoever because you don't even need to shoot the fucking thing to beat it. There was, however, this emblem, so we grabbed that and took the elevator up to get our stats for the end of chapter 1-2. It's really interesting to see how low the accuracy is here, and I can only assume that's because of all the missed shots on the emblems. Whoops. Anyways, chapter 2-1 started, and my plan was to take fewer fights in general, mainly because the accuracy was dropping, but also because it's just so much easier to run past enemies and preserve ammo. I was also interested to see how this bridge section would go since you essentially have a time limit to hit a target, but much like the very first fight in the game, you pretty much load in aiming at a red barrel, so it wasn't much of a challenge. I did however get an achievement that I don't think I've ever gotten in my entire life somehow when I killed these guys with a red barrel, which was pretty cool. Whilst I let Sheva clean up the rest of the enemies, I focused on getting this emblem below the bridge, which I could barely even see the red dot for, 
I even had to reset my aim because I got so lost. The next emblem I want to talk about is this fucking thing right here, okay? This stupid fucking emblem is so tucked away and in the most ridiculous spot possible that I even struggle to shoot it using a mouse. I'm not kidding, I had to speed this up because it took so long to finally break it and I didn't want to waste my ammo spamming. Later on, I got this one pretty easily and I started to feel like I was getting a hang of these longer shots. Now, in this section of the game, I wanted to try my hand at a speedrun strat that would let me skip the entire section where Sheva has to fight in the opposite building all by herself. I wanted to try this for a few reasons. I wanted Sheva to save all of her pistol ammo because there was no way I was giving her another gun, like ever. But also, the strat involves throwing a grenade in a very specific spot that's almost impossible to hit without a crosshair, and you only get a crosshair when playing on PC. So I gave it a go, and ideally, you want to throw a grenade right around here, but I was finding it really hard and had even reset several times. I was really close to giving up with this strat. But then I remembered something. The monitor that I'm using to play this game has a built-in setting to place a crosshair on the screen. I can play this game with a fucking crosshair. Now, obviously you can't see the crosshair in the recording because it doesn't actually put a crosshair in the game. It's just on my monitor. But if you could see it, then it would look something like this. It's really big and kind of distracting, but it helped me in this case because I was able to line up the crosshair with where I needed to aim. And I got this door open without sending Sheva to the other building. Still with me? Great, because I bombarded this guy with as many grenades as I could, and here are the end of chapter 2-1 stats. Chapter 2-2 up next, and as far as I remember, I actually always took damage here as a kid, but I guess I was just really bad at games back then, because this part wasn't at all hard. I don't know how I ever fucked it up. As you might know, the next part was the underground section, but I haven't included any of it here because I basically just picked up the lamp and ran past all of the enemies. I didn't kill a single one, or maybe I killed like one or two. Either way, nothing spectacular or noteworthy happened. What that means though, is that we can focus on the first actual difficult boss battle, the Popo... Popo... Popo Karimu? Popo, Popo Karimu? It's the bat thing, the big, weird, ugly bat. So I've always found it really difficult to kill this thing. It just feels like the bat's AI always focuses on you and no matter how many times Sheva says to get on the opposite side, she just follows you everywhere so you can never get behind the thing. Not only that, but using the sniper rifle here was so, so difficult. I missed almost every single shot because the motion controls were pretty tough to control against an enemy that could move as fast as this one. But after a bit of luck, I did manage to knock it down and put a full magazine into its underbelly to finish it off. This was by far one of the hardest enemies we were gonna face all game because I knew for a fact that for future boss fights we would have enough money to buy rocket launchers. But either way, it was really interesting to put motion controls up to a real test, and at this point, I was really hoping I didn't have to fight anything as challenging as that again. Also, I think putting an entire magazine into this thing managed to keep my accuracy nice and high, getting an S rank for the whole chapter. Chapter 2-3 was probably the chapter that I was the most excited for, because this whole chapter requires you to control the turret on the back of the vehicle that's being driven by our good buddy, soon to be dead, Dave Johnson. There's no moving about, there's no BSAA emblems, nothing. Just some straight up motion control shooting. At first, I thought this would be really difficult, but I actually found the motion controls way easier to use than a mouse or controller. It just felt really smooth and polished when I was guiding the aim with my actual hands. And unironically, I think I actually cleared this section here the quickest I've ever done it, because I usually get caught up shooting the wrong things. We breezed through all of this section to enjoy this interesting cutscene of our guy Dave just full sending it over this broken bridge and after a bit of drama we got to fight Giga Dave. Sorry, Gigante. Wait, no, sorry, it's it's Nadesu? Endesu? This guy wasn't very spectacular to fight. It all felt very similar to the previous section. However, I did have a bit of trouble adjusting my aim here and there. And I think that's because this thing was getting all up close and personal, which I didn't have in the previous section. Also, I didn't notice this before using motion controls, but when you're shooting the turret, your aim indefinitely goes up. So you need to keep bringing your arm down slowly just to keep the aim steady. And eventually you end up with your arm in the floor, which was annoying to say the least. So anyways, we beat this guy and got our stats for chapter 2-3. I thought the accuracy would be a lot higher after the final boss fight given that he was up close, but I guess I probably missed a lot of shots against the bikers. Speeding into chapter 3-1, we're visiting the beautiful and lush marshlands where, to be honest, there wasn't really much to talk about. With every enemy encounter, I was just running past them trying to collect all four of these shards, so I wasn't using the motion controls at all. I was hoping that maybe the boat we're driving would have some kind of motion control option because it would really make for a fun experience, but sadly it was just the standard control input. My favourite part about this chapter was that I discovered that the chickens on this island here can actually lay eggs and if you leave and return over and over, they can basically lay an infinite number of eggs. So uh, I killed a bit of free time I had and yeah.
Anyways, I also picked up this rocket launcher, which we were going to use at the Irving boss fight, and then I made my way to the next section. There was another strategy that I wanted to try here where I basically get Sheva to follow me down this drop. Having her with me in here prevents the wooden barriers in the floor from going up and prevents a bunch of enemy spawns so that we can grab this magnum and get out safely. Heading around here will teach this big guy a lesson and have Sheva bring down the drawbridge to close out the chapter. Just like I said, there wasn't much to talk about, but for the enemies I did fight, I got a final accuracy of 54.9%. I think missing shots on the chickens when I farmed for the eggs probably didn't help here. Chapter 3-2 was a bit of a turning point in the gameplay because it was really starting to feel like I knew what I was doing with the motion controls. My aim felt a lot more honed when I did have to fight enemies, and I knew that it was easier to run away than it was to fight anyways. So, after a quick cowardly run to this raft, I had Sheva pull me through what felt like a holiday in Florida and progress to the Tricell campsite. It was here that I got jumped by a snake and I took that as an opportunity to bring up my British roots. I tried my hand at killing this guy with my knife but he just kept getting away as soon as I pulled it out so eventually I did give up and shoot him but he didn't even drop anything anyway. This part of the game is one of the many parts that I dreaded playing as a kid. It was just so scary to fight off all these enemies whilst also being chased by not one but two chainsaw dudes that definitely felt impossible to kill and even now I was a little bit worried. Just like the previous sections though I did a bit of running and dodging so that I could get all three of these valves to and then I made my way to the exit to meet up with Josh. This part was super easy because I could just shoot the enemies before they got through the windows or as they walked past the fence and by the time these two bigger enemies showed up Josh had restored access to the elevator. I was worried the enemies would catch up to us before Josh got the exit door unlocked but before they could even get close it was open and we were onto the docks. For the docks I had a plan. The idea was to drop down here so that I didn't have to run into any of the enemies and then as soon as I got up off of the platforms I threw a grenade at the locked gate so that the enemies close to it would be stunned and the gate would unlock. After that I waited for these enemies to get closer to this tripwire before setting it off so that they got stunned too and when it came to shooting this one I actually missed and almost got my head caved in. Fortunately my head remained intact and we managed to get out of there alive to see our end of chapter stats which in my opinion had a pretty good accuracy score considering I had to do a lot of shooting at the elevator section. In chapter 3-3 I started off by avoiding pretty much every fight I could and I opened this first gate here. I had a go at trying to shoot these giant explosive tanker things and I can't lie my aim was feeling pretty accurate. I got off the boat at the next gate and ended up having to take out these guys from a distance because they kept shooting at us but once I'd done that I opened the gate and we progressed forward to get Irving. Also I really love how Josh says this line here. Okay. Let's go get this Irving. It just makes me laugh every time. Anyways, the strategy for beating Irving was to hopefully use the rocket launcher I picked up earlier to quickly skip the first phase of this fight, then use the turrets to take him down. So that's exactly what I did. I actually thought I missed the rocket shot here, but thankfully we're not actually moving in the ocean, so my rocket made contact. Then I hopped onto the turret here, put as many bullets as I could to Irving. He did try to attack me here, so I had to come off and dodge. But on the next round of shooting, I did actually manage to finish him off. And just like that, we beat chapter 3-3 marking the halfway point in the game. The accuracy in this section was 81.5%, which made sense since I did have to fight off some enemies that I couldn't just ignore back at the gates, but it's still pretty high. After all that fighting, Josh dropped us off at arguably one of the coolest areas in the whole game. The way this entire chapter is designed is just amazing, in my opinion. But on the other hand, it was also the only chapter that younger me would give up on because it was too confusing. It was like the child safety walk for the whole game. If you couldn't get past these chapters, you weren't old enough to be playing it. I did have to do a bit of shooting after dropping down here in order to progress, but once I'd gotten through, I made my way over to this wheel and got it turning to open this door. I was a little bit worried I'd die here because of how many enemies were around, so I just ran straight to the door so that a few of them would despawn, and then I cleaned up the rest. I then tried to get this emblem that was really far away, and it took me a lot of bullets and a lot of time, but I did eventually get it. This was probably the hardest one to get. It definitely took me the longest, but I think that's because it was so far away and I wasn't using a sniper rifle. Then I picked up some of the loot in this area, and it was at this exact moment when I was adjusting my right arm that I realized there are more features to the motion controls. Completely by accident, I found that shaking your right Joy-Con either sideways or up and down will either quick slash or reload. When I realized this, I felt really stupid. I was over halfway through the game and I had only just discovered how to quick reload and quick slash. Either way, I was happy with this new knowledge and I continued through to what is known as the best quick time event sequence known to man. What the team cooked up here is truly phenomenal and is absolutely a core memory of mine. No, I'm not being sarcastic. <clears throat>
In this next puzzle section, we made sure to grab the grenade launcher here before proceeding to activate each one of these giant pulley things so that we could raise the stairs for the next section and trigger the boss fight. Fortunately, with this fight, we could actually run away from it completely so that we didn't have to go through the struggles we had in chapter two and instead have it killed by a quick time event before getting our first end of chapter screen for chapter four. Clearly, all those missed shots on the emblem impacted our accuracy a lot, so I guess a sniper rifle probably would have been better for that one. Chapter 4-2 was pretty much all running around. I tried not to fight too many enemies unless I was forced to, and in my head, the real danger here was this giant beam of light, because I definitely remember dying to it many times throughout my childhood. For the sea emblem, I pretty much just ran up to it, grabbed it, and ran away. And for the sky emblem, we actually had to send Sheva over to get it, so I triggered the checkpoint and hit a quick tactical restart so that the enemies on my tail would despawn. Then, we launched Sheva over, and it seemed like she was having some trouble making her way past the enemies on the stairs in front of her. So, I threw a grenade of encouragement at her, and she eventually picked up the sky emblem. When it came to the earth emblem, it was the exact same as before. I ran, I picked it up, and I ran. It was just easier to do it this way. Anyways, I popped the emblems into their respective slots here, and went inside the big pyramid thing. It was in here that I found another snake, and this time, I was not letting it go. I walked with it against the wall, whipped out my knife, and actually managed to kill it this time to get this achievement that I didn't even know existed, a cut above. Entering the actual puzzle section, I was really hoping the motion controls would be able to turn these mirrors, but my expectations were low given the lack of motion control usage anyways, and unfortunately, my expectations were not exceeded. Anyways, I completed the rest of the puzzles and continued to the final cutscene of this chapter to reveal our end of chapter stats. I'm really not sure why the accuracy is on 0% despite having 4 enemies killed. I think maybe my grenade didn't actually do any damage, and then maybe Sheva's kills count towards the overall total, because I definitely didn't do any fighting this chapter, but honestly, I just have no idea. In chapter 5-1, we pick up where we left off in this really pretty garden, and then proceed into the Tricel facility, where we see Chris and Sheva do this really stupid animation. After a bit of exploring, we call for this elevator to collect us, whilst a bunch of wickers hunt us down. I really didn't want to mess with these guys because I knew they would use up a lot of resources, so I just let Sheva take the hits for me, and eventually the elevator arrived. Finding ourselves on this giant revolving platform, we encountered our next boss fight, U8, or Ultimate 8, I guess? Kind of a shit name. I tried to kill this guy with the rocket launcher here, but I actually missed the shot on my first attempt, and I had to restart and try again. On my second attempt, I made sure to aim at the mouth, and sure enough, he went down in one hit. This whole playthrough was starting to feel like a lot of running and a lot of rocket launchers. At least that's how it felt for now. Anyways, with only one enemy killed, we got our end of chapter screen to see that we got a nice 100% on the accuracy score. Heading deeper into the experimental facility, we came across our very first soldier machinis, enemies that can actually shoot us as we run away. I couldn't help but wonder if running away from them was still a viable strategy, so I gave it a go here and yeah, you can just run past them. I think if we were still on veteran difficulty, it wouldn't be as easy to run as it is right now. But also, if we were still on Veteran, I definitely wouldn't have made it this far without giving up. We did our silly little door opening animation and watched this Magini vanish into thin air. And when I came across the next enemies, I panicked a little bit and hid behind these boxes. Once I'd mustered up the courage to carry on running, I headed up the stairs and blew these guys with guns up before entering the elevator. Going down this hallway, I carried on running because if you're fast enough, you can actually hug these walls and the Wickers are too busy completing their own animations to pay attention to you. Then, much like previous chapters, instead of taking fights and struggling to hit shots with motion controls, I just ran past as many enemies as I could, and this right here is exactly why you shouldn't run past everyone. Progressing onwards, I grabbed this machine gun, turned the power on for the conveyor belts, and had our first encounter with the Reaper who, surprise surprise, we can run past and head to the next section, which is another boss fight. This time, it's a second fight with the goth spaghetti BOW, except this time, we can just... And here's the kicker. Throughout this entire chapter, we killed 11 enemies, but still managed to retain a 100% accuracy score, so I must be doing something, right? Chapter 5-3 was a crazy experience from start to finish. We started by doing a little bit of target practice on these range Maginis. They kind of suck at aiming from great distances, so it was pretty good to practice using motion controls here. I then tried running past another Reaper, but yeah, I guess you can't just do that every time. After loading back in, the Reaper actually spawned in a different spot this time, which kind of threw me off, and then Sheva ended up getting herself killed, so 
I had to try that one again. This time, I brought with me the grenade launcher and thankfully I was able to get rid of this guy for good. And as I was doing a little more target practice, I ran into yet another reaper which I had to take care of. Once that was handled, I grabbed this sniper rifle and killed these guys whilst waiting to send Shevet across. I also took this opportunity to use the sniper rifle a little more because I'd only used it a little bit back in chapter two and I wanted to make sure I still knew what I was doing with it because I planned on using it in the final chapter. Returning back to the revolving platform, we pulled these levers to get moving on and we had to shoot these guys trying to stop us, which at first I thought would be really difficult since the platform was rotating, the enemies were far away and I was using motion controls. But when I tell you I hit the most insane headshot on this guy without missing, I was actually blown away. I really wasn't expecting it to be this easy, but I got the next guy too, and then we proceeded to the monarch room entrance where there wasn't anything to talk about. I just pushed this thing over and headed into the monarch room to start what would be the longest boss fight of my life. I don't know too much about the speedrun strats for this fight, but I do know that some of the speedrunners like to shoot a rocket launcher at the very start. I have no idea why or where I'm meant to shoot it. In fact, I'm pretty sure I just wasted my money buying it because nothing happened, but you know, it was worth a shot. I then also fucked up the fight here because I didn't know which buttons were coming up and Wesker ended up kicking my ass so I decided to restart so that I could at least get my health back and try again. After restarting I did as much damage to him as I could until eventually he kicked us into phase 2 of his fight where he would chase us around the monarch room and we would need to hide and deal damage when he wasn't looking. I managed to get this desert eagle looking gun thanks to Sheva and spent the rest of the fight hiding around corners and waiting to shoot Wesker. I think maybe I took a little too long with this fight or maybe I did something wrong because at one point Wesker just straight up ran away for no reason. But I wasn't really complaining because I was getting kind of bored so we moved on to the Jill fight. The Jill fight was extremely annoying. She does a lot of jumping around so it's really hard to shoot her regardless of your input device. But with motion controls it was 10 times harder. The idea is to shoot her leg, then her chest, then her leg, then her chest and so on. Because shooting her leg exposes her chest and shooting her chest hides it. If you do that on loop you can beat Jill very quickly but it's actually really tough to do that. Sometimes I can't even do it with mouse and keyboard. My first attempt at beating Jill resulted in her dying and I think it's because I shot her in the head too many times. Anyways, I had to try again and this time I kind of focused on not shooting her too much and seeing if Sheva would do something useful for once. And to my surprise, she actually did grab Jill a few times which allowed me to try and pull that glowy thing off of her chest. It took a while, but we did eventually successfully save Jill. It's really funny though because the way I edited these cutscenes makes it seem like we just straight up killed her. Like, she's fucking dead now, we're out of here. This chapter was beaten exactly 30 minutes flat, which kind of freaks me out because it made me feel like Wesker really did just give up. But with all of chapter 5 out of the way, we were finally in the home stretch with chapter 6-1, which we're going to call chapter 6-run because that's what I did, baby, it's what I do, it's what I'm best at. In fact, I'm so good at running that the game had to physically stop me by forcing me to fight this guy after Sheva got trapped in this container. Now, one of these Maginis turned into a bitey guy, I don't know what to call him, but he basically eats you. However, there is a Magini that will stay in the container throwing grenades at you. So I ran around baiting the grenade guy to throw one at us and had the chumpy dude walk into the grenade so that he would explode and die without me having to dump ammo into him. I know, I'm very smart. I also had this guy blow himself up which I thought was really funny. Anyways, once I was out of there, I climbed this ladder to find the controls for the shipping containers and helped Sheva out before we found ourselves inside the ship. This guy over here was just asking to be shot at so I shot him and got jump scared by a cutscene telling me that everyone was now aggro on me so I cleaned up and moved on. I hit some nasty shots here too, like these guys just couldn't hit me from the angle they were at but I could hit them so I was kind of fucking them up. Carrying on, we jumped down this hole to get to the other side of the room and I basically painted an outline of this guy because I wasn't expecting to shoot anyone down here and I kind of panicked. I just thought that was so funny. Once we were on the other side, we encountered our first big guy with a machine gun and I knew he was super tanky, like a real bullet sponge, so I weighed down some landmines and I dumped as much ammo into him as I could before we managed to get his keycard and continue through the store. Funny little animation style. Then we found our way to this elevator and here are our end of chapter stats. An S rank overall, including the accuracy, which just tells me that I'm probably performing about as good as I could with a mouse and keyboard at this point except for how long it was taking me to get through these chapters. Chapter 6-2 starts with Excella transforming into not just a regular goth spaghetti, but a giga goth spaghetti, followed by another silly quick time event, which I've kindly edited to make it look like we didn't have to do all that. Making our way back through the ship, I made sure to kill all of the enemies here because one of them turns into a chompy guy and I couldn't remember which one, but once I'd figured that out, I blew him up and took his keycard so that we could get out of here and finally fight Excella 
once and for all. The Excel fight wasn't tough by any means whatsoever, but it was unreasonably long in my opinion. The game lets you use the bridge keycard to unlock this weapon called the satellite laser targeting device, which is an absolutely crazy concept if you ask me. Like why are we able to control a giant space laser right now? What's more crazy though is that the giant space laser fucking sucks. I decided not to use any of my own weapons for this fight because I was truly curious to see how effective the space laser was and I eventually found out that it's awful because we're playing on amateur difficulty and it took 15 shots to finally kill this thing. Also, it was pretty hard to lock on sometimes because the big ball things would move around pretty fast and I found it tough to swing my arm around in real time trying to track it. But in the end, we beat the chapter and it did only take us 13 minutes, which was still considered an S rank. Finally, we'd made it to the very last chapter in the game, chapter 6-3. The ship was falling apart, everything was on fire, but we'd made it and we were so ready to put Wesker in his place. I had to do a lot of shooting here, so I'll just let the clips speak for themselves. It was mostly just making sure we didn't die whilst we waited for this gate to open. And then once the gate was open, we had to clear out all of the enemies ahead, which I did using a sniper rifle. Oh, I also found a rotten egg for some reason and got the egg hunt achievement. I was really worried that after pulling these levers, we would get absolutely destroyed by the reapers that spawned behind us. But fortunately, I took out the first one pretty quickly and I was really close to getting impaled by this guy creeping up on me. But Sheva hit the most insane combo to put this guy on his ass. And once I'd reloaded, I finished him off. That's right, Sheva was actually useful again. Thanks, Sheva. As you might know, once this second gate opens, not one, but two big fellas with big guns appear out of nowhere and try to fuck shit up. I'm not even gonna lie, I genuinely struggled managing this fight because we were also surrounded by Maginis who were just hunting us down non-stop. I took a lot of damage, used a lot of ammo and missed a lot of shots, but I did eventually get both of the big guys down and proceeded to the first Wesker fight on the hangar. I kinda knew what I needed to do here. I had to grab a rocket launcher, grab some rockets, and turn off the lights so that we could catch Wesker by surprise and stun him with a rocket. My first rocket shot actually missed him by literally a couple of pixels, and then he jump scare charged at me. It was actually scary. We soon got another rocket, and this time Sheva took aim, and we were able to stun Wesker for a minute, but I ended up blowing myself up. After a while, we did manage to stun him successfully, and this let me restrain him so that Sheva could give him the shot. He gets all freaky and like jumps on the bomber plane and starts taking off. So just like anyone else would, Chris and Sheva chase the moving airplane and jump on. I would have done it too, 100%. I want to highlight my editing for this next section one more time because I just straight up made Wesker look like a fucking idiot in this cutscene. Anyways, yeah, quick time event, we crash the plane, yada yada, Wesker comes out of the wreckage looking all mean and shit, and we move on to the volcano section. This game's so fucking dumb. So, for the first part of this fight, we just needed to deal enough damage to him so that he would leave us alone and start chasing Sheva. I started by blasting this rocket launcher at him, which with any other boss would just kill him and end the fight, but for some reason Wesker is just straight up built different. So he tanked it and I used the magnum to damage him that little bit more, which would reveal the orange thingy on his back and shooting that made him chase Sheva instead of me. The problem is, Sheva's a fucking idiot with zero survival instincts, so she got in a bit of trouble whilst I was playing with my favourite boulder. I realised that I can stun Wesker using a sniper rifle so long as I hit him in the chest, so I did that whilst Sheva climbed up and eventually we were on the centre stage for the final show. This part I found very, very easy. I just pumped as much ammo into him as I could so that I could eventually pin him down and let Sheva stab him. I used the grenade launcher a few times but it just didn't feel like it was cutting it in terms of how much damage we could deal. So I switched back to the magnum and it ended up triggering this little cutscene to reveal his orange thing a bit more. At this point I was just switching back and forth between weapons and seeing which one felt more effective, eventually using an assault rifle to stun him. It was at that point I thought surely I could restrain him now and at first I thought I couldn't but it turns out I just needed to get behind him which I didn't actually know. Anyways I restrained him and Sheva starts hacking and slashing at him which by the way makes literally zero sense. Like why is a knife more effective than an actual fucking grenade launcher or an assault rifle? I just don't get the logic behind it but 
Either way, I was happy we were finally coming to the end. He did all this really dramatic flailing about, and then, very conveniently, the volcano we were fighting in decided to start collapsing. Even more conveniently, Josh and Jill showed up in a helicopter, blah blah blah, we blast the fuck out of Wesker, he's dead, we win, we've seen it all before. Can I just point out, by the way, that this guy is like some insane superhuman freak who can tank bullets like a champion, yet somehow he's suddenly not strong enough to pull the helicopter down, despite having a clear solid grip on it. I love this game so much, but come on, it's so bad. But yeah, just like that, we'd finally finished our playthrough of Resident Evil 5 using only motion controls to aim. I put together a list of all our different scores from each chapter completed and calculated the total or the average, etc. And for accuracy, we got an average of 65.02%, which I'd say that's actually quite all right, especially considering it was my first time using the Joy-Cons for this game. Not only that, but I definitely felt myself getting better with them towards the end of the game, and if we didn't throw that grenade in chapter 4-2, it probably would have been a lot higher. For the total number of kills, it definitely started dropping towards the very end of the game, because we literally just started running past enemies since it was so much easier to do that. If we'd have played on veteran difficulty, this wouldn't have been possible and we'd have way more kills. The total number of kills was 325, which... Yeah, I guess it's alright. Most of them were in chapter 2-3 with the turrets on the car and I'm pretty sure Sheva got the majority of them, so yeah. For the total number of deaths, I accidentally made the graphic upside down, so they're actually in order from 6-3 to 1-1, but either way, we only died 3 times, which was in chapter 5-3 when we died to reapers and accidentally killed Jill. And last but not least, the total time spent playing this game using only motion controls was... 3 hours, 52 minutes and 14 seconds. So it's definitely no speedrun, but I think it's a pretty good time. In my opinion, it was just about the right length of time to enjoy experimenting with a different playstyle without it being so long that I got bored of it. So yeah, pretty good. But uh, that's about it. Would I recommend playing this game using only motion controls? Probably not. It was a neat little concept that definitely intrigued me, but it's nowhere near as immersive as, say, using a Wii remote was back in the day playing games like House of the Dead, for example. That being said, Resident Evil 5 as a whole performs quite well on the Nintendo Switch. The load times were a little on the longer side, but if you're on the go and just need a little nostalgia to pass the time, then I definitely recommend giving it a try. There's even a demo available for if you're unsure. If you liked this video, please consider hitting the like and subscribe button. My goal here is to make a lot of cool and interesting shit, so... If you're into that, then, you know, stick around and I'll see you in the next one.